Ardipithecus was a species of hominid living between 5.7 and 4.4 million years ago. Two sets of fossils have been uncovered, Ardipithecus cataba and Ardipithecus ramidus, the former giving us various pieces of skeletal bone and the latter providing us with an almost complete skull on top of a large amount of skeletal bones. It should be noted that the pieces come from as much as 110 different specimens. The fossils were found by the research group of Johannes Haile Selassie in Ethiopia. Although Ardipithecus lived after the split between the ancestral lines of humans and chimpanzees, where exactly this species should be placed in our family history remains uncertain. And whether Ardipithecus is one of our direct ancestors? Well, that's nothing more than speculation. But, based on the time when and the place where it lived, it is still an interesting hominid to discuss. In this video we want to specifically focus on the brain of Ardipithecus. Since soft tissue rarely fossilizes, we do not have direct remains of the brain. So we have to go by clues that we can get from the skull. And of those, we also only have one, which admittedly is not a great sample size. So the things that we will be discussing in this video should be interpreted with caution, there is a lot of speculation. Nevertheless, let us take a look at the available data and research and discuss what we know about the brain of Ardipithecus. In the previous episode, we discussed the brain of Sahelanthropus chadensis, a hominid species that lived 1 to 2 million years before. A lot of research has focused on the question whether Sahelanthropus chadensis and Ardipithecus are closely related. Some of their facial features seem to indicate that this may indeed be the case. Both have a rather slim face and probably relatively small jaws. Also, their canines are significantly smaller than those observed in modern great ape species. Together, this suggests that Ardipithecus was probably largely feeding on fruits and not so much on harder foods, such as nuts. But let's have a look at Ardipithecus' brain. With an average of 300 cubic centimeters, Ardipithecus had a fairly small brain size, in the same range as modern bonobos, and smaller than modern chimpanzees. It is also slightly smaller than that of Sahelanthropus chadensis and it is certainly smaller than later living Australopithecines. In fact, it is probably the smallest brain within our ancestral family tree from the last 7 million years. One specific feature that Ardipithecus shares with both Sahelanthropus chadensis and later hominins, but is distinctly different from modern apes, is the location of the foramen magnum. That is, the place and the angle where the spinal cord enters the skull and the brain. It is placed significantly more forward than in modern chimpanzees, and the angle it enters the skull is around 90 degrees, whereas in chimpanzees it's closer to 60 degrees. Generally, this is taken as evidence that Ardipithecus, just as other hominids with the same feature, spend a significant amount of time on two legs. Although the feet of Ardipithecus retain some primitive features, like an outward protruding toe, there is accumulating evidence from the shape of the hands and the hips and the length of the lumbar spine that this ape was well adapted to move on the ground, while at the same time it was still a great climber. Environmental evidence also suggests that Ardipithecus lived in a more open grassland that contained less trees than the environments where modern great apes live. So the ability to walk upright, even if it was not as good as in later hominins, would be very beneficial. Now, is there any more evidence for a close connection between Sahelanthropus chadensis and Ardipithecus? Well, let's take a look at more features that they have in common. Ardipithecus had a relatively narrow post-orbital region, which is very similar to Sahelanthropus. On the other hand, in later Australopithecines, post-orbital widening is observed. It has been suggested that this widening in later species relates to an increase in prefrontal cortex regions and consequently greater cognitive abilities. This does not seem to be the case in Ardipithecus. However, how intelligence differed between pre-tool-making Sahelanthropus, Ardipithecus and Australopithecines remains speculative, as all these species may have been quite similar in their behavioral patterns. 
Another interesting observation is that the back of the brain, meaning the occipitotemporal region as well as the cerebellum, seems to be tucked under in Ardipithecus. Consequently, the visual cortex is somewhat more ventral and the cerebellum is placed more forward. This feature is also observed in Sahelanthropus chadensis, but not in modern apes and also to a much lesser degree in later Australopithecines. Whether this basic cranial or occipital flexion had any functional consequences remains unclear. Most likely it reflects an early adaptation to upright posture and a more forwardly placed foramen magnum. It is however interesting that this feature is not so clear in later Australopithecines. It might suggest that brain morphology adapted differently in divergent lines in early upright walking hominids. The caudal basic cranial flexion and the narrow post-orbital regions is what Sahelanthropus chadensis and Ardipithecus have in common. Yet, several reports still doubt that there is a close relationship between both hominids. And indeed, there are some crucial differences. Looking from above, the brain of Sahelanthropus has an elongated shape that is much longer than that is wide. In contrast, the front to back distance in Ardipithecus is rather short. As a consequence of the narrow frontal regions, the back of the brain is quite wide, resulting in an almost triangular shape. This suggests a widening of regions in the parietal cortex. This increased parietal area is also observed in later Australopithecines. Particularly in Australopithecus afarensis, the same triangular shape can be observed. It is less obvious in Australopithecus africanus, but this may be explained by the widening of the frontal regions. A change in brain shape may simply reflect reorganization and may not have functional consequences. But if we for now assume that relative size of the parietal brain regions indeed increased in Ardipithecus, what could this indicate? Parietal regions are crucially involved in spatial navigation, among other things. A change in the demand on spatial navigation may thus change the parietal cortex organization. So in the case of Ardipithecus, we know that the environment changed from forest to a more open landscape. And this may go hand in hand with the changes with how an individual navigates through the world. It is possible that a more open environment requires to travel larger distances to find food. And this may require higher demands on spatial memory, which could be reflected by a potential increase in size of the parietal cortex. If we observe Ardipithecus skull from the side, the observation of the parietal cortex morphology seems to be supported as well. The top of the brain and skull is more rounded than in Sahelanthropus chadensis, and it looks much more similar to Australopithecus afarensis. So if we combine this evidence, what can we conclude? Some features of Ardipithecus brain resemble the features of Sahelanthropus chadensis, in particular the narrowing of the post-orbital region and basic cranial flexion. But other features, like the widening of parietal cortex regions, are more in line with later hominins, like Australopithecus afarensis. So how does Ardipithecus fit within the evolutionary line? Could Ardipithecus be directly related to a Sahelanthropus chadensis? Well, we don't know for certain, but the large difference between rostral caudal length of the cranium and the brain would be quite surprising if this were the case. Okay, but is Ardipithecus directly related to later Australopithecines? Well, from a brain morphology perspective this could be the case, as their general brain shape is somewhat similar. The only clear difference is how wide the frontal regions are. However, other features outside of the brain speak against the direct relationship. Whereas Ardipithecus had a narrow face and a small jaw, Australopithecines, in particular Australopithecus afarensis and other robust Australopithecines, had very wide faces with strong jaws. This probably reflects a shift in diet from primarily fruits to harder foods like nuts and roots. Additionally, there seems to be sexual dimorphism in Australopithecines, meaning that males were significantly larger than females. But such dimorphism seems to be absent in Ardipithecus. In the end, more research is needed before we can establish the exact family relationship between Sahelanthropus, Jodensis, Ardipithecus and Australopithecines. Nevertheless, Ardipithecus has an interesting brain and we hope you agree.
So if you enjoyed this analysis of Artipithecus brain, consider leaving a like. And as always, we hope to see you the next time.